Hello everyone, this is Ayaz Ahmad, your host for the Fundraisers podcast. Today I'm absolutely excited. I'm about to talk with Jaleel Rashid, who has easily raised more than 10 billion US dollars. Welcome. Jaleel, how are you doing? Great to have you on the show. I'm good, Ayaz. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no, no, really excited. Um, just want to tell the viewers and, and, and those listening uh, something about you. 26-year-old becomes the CEO of Aberdeen, right, in Malaysia. At the age of 30, you become the CEO of Invesco in Singapore. And then at the age of 37, you become the youngest ever CEO of a government-backed fund, right? One of the biggest. I mean, the PMB, I heard it's like... It controls 30% of the Malaysia economy or something. I mean, it's amazing, right? And I'm just like super excited to have you here. And I, and I would love for you to introduce yourself. Also, Jaleel, you've raised like billions of dollars, like easily over 10 billion, right, over your career. And I think there's just so much you can share with people. And I'm just massively excited to welcome you, actually. And uh, perhaps you could tell everyone like, you know, a little bit about yourself and a little bit of background about how you got into sales and, you know, your story. Yeah, thanks, Ayes. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm Malaysian by nationality and, you know, born and bred in, in Malaysia to civil servant parents. Quite fortunate, I had a stint of, abroad in between, finished my studies in Malaysia, and I was looking for the first thing, the fastest job I can get into right after school. <laughs> and finance was pretty appealing because everyone was earning a good amount of money. So it's quite shallow thinking back then. Um, and then uh, Aberdeen were one of the few companies back then that were hiring graduate trainees. I had no idea. I remember the interview that I had with Hugh Young. He said, what do you know about fund management? I said, I, have n I know nothing at all. He said, wonderful. That's why, <laughs> 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 That's why we're here to, uh, to help you. So yeah, I joined as a grad trainee. I got rotated around doing investment, fundraising, and even compliance. And after that, they asked me, how do you feel about it? I said, yeah, I kind of like it. You know, people are great. What do you want to do? I said, I want to do investments. I ended up in the emerging markets team doing Latin American equities, Eastern Europe. So quite fun. I was 22 years old, you know, traveling to all these wow. places and looking at investments. And I did that for a few years. And then Aberdeen got licensed to operate in Malaysia. They were one of the actually largest foreign investors in the Malaysian market. So it just made sense for them to have a base there. Mm. Um, and then they asked me if I was keen to kind of run that place. I had no idea about how to run a country business or sales. And they said, just don't screw it up. Um, <laughs> so there, 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 was a, there was a lot of faith given in that. So uh, I then set up the office uh, that included everything from finding real estate space to kind of cold calling clients. I remember I, I had to find the numbers of all the largest institutional clients here. And I cold called them and said, look, you know, we just set up. Can I come in? Uh, get a meeting with you and yeah, they, they were quite polite enough obviously you know it took like four weeks to nail a date but yeah that's the start of fundraising I, I kept the dual role on doing investments as well as fundraising that involves setting up the Malaysian greenfield business then the Sharia business then I moved to Singapore with Invesco building out the Southeast Asian business, worked on some ad hoc projects along the way as well, acquisitions and all, and then returned to Malaysia for national service with PNB. After PNB, now I've decided to go into corporate, you know, so I think elements of fundraising exist in all, all the roles, uh, but to different. Right. Uh, Great. No, thanks for sharing that background. Uh, I think it's really interesting. I wanted to ask you, like, you started your career off investments, you said, and you did a few other things, and then eventually you got into more of a fundraising role, right? Sort of midway through your career. Was there any proper training? I mean, like, what was your sales process and how did you go about it? I mean, you mentioned, like, you would, you know, just had a cold calling session called, like, 50 clients, all right? Well, I mean, that's not an easy thing to do, especially if you're only, like, 23 or whatever, how, how old you were at the time. So like, what, what was your sales process? Was there good training given and was, was that enough? And then how did you kind of go and maybe share, maybe share an example of a fund maybe that you won and how that happened? Yeah. I, I've always enjoyed meeting people. And although the investment role allowed me to meet company CEOs and all, I was really quite fascinated with the whole client process. There was a part of me that felt that, you know, I could do a good job there because I kind of, 
knew the people, I knew the culture, I knew sometimes when people not in certain countries, that doesn't really mean they like it. You know, it's just a mark, it's, a mark, uh, it's yeah. like a sign of respect. And then I guess when we were at a very startup phase, everyone needed to kind of roll their sleeves up and, and do the work. So there was no clear demarcation or oh, you were sales, you were investment. Everyone had to do it, right? It was purely from a cost consideration. And that's how I, I guess I accidentally stumbled into it. The only guidance I asked from my bosses back then is that, what is it that you want to achieve? Do you want to get just many, many clients and a few millions here and there? Or do you want to get a few clients with several hundred million each? Because both those approaches would require a very different kind of tactic. Right. And at that time, it was pretty clear the Malaysian market was somewhat fragmented. We have about four or five large clients and then some mid clients and then smaller clients. So at that time, we decided to focus our attention on the large clients. So there was a need to kind of understand the organizational chart. And this was, mind you, this was early early 2000s, you know, the transparency of information wasn't as good as it is today. You know, you go to the website and you see the entire management directory, you know, some of them have their contact details, you know, uh, they're on LinkedIn and all that. But back then, you know, it was just like, you know, CEO, CIO, that's it. And you had no idea who was underneath right. that. Yeah. <laughs> And, and I remember the first person I called was a gentleman in EPF. Uh, he was a senior manager then who then went on to become the chief investment officer of, of the firm. We meet up occasionally now and I said, you know, I'm grateful. He gave me that first yeah. meeting and allowed us to kind of speak. But I remember my first meeting with him, I actually didn't speak anything about Aberdeen. I introduced myself and asked him everything about EPF because I knew I had one hour with him. I had to find out who was in charge of what, how it was structured, who makes decisions, how decisions are made, how long it will take, what would they be keen on? If I push something in front of them, would it, would they even care? You know, what would make them go, mm, yes, that's something that we are looking for. This is something interesting, but we're not going to do it for the next five years. So I really wanted to understand so that I could focus my resources properly. So I spent the first meeting with him just understanding that. And I remember when he when I left, he said, you barely spoke anything about Aberdeen. I said, yeah, well, that, we'll leave that for the next day. Wow. <laughs> we'll leave that for the next day. So all my first meetings then, I approached it that way so that I can mentally map out what the org structure looked like. And then from then on, it was a lot of meetings trying to understand the working level people because I think one of the big mistakes that we do is that thinking that, you know, oh, you got that inning with the, the CIO and everything is going to be okay. But the world has evolved, right? Maybe this was the case 20 years ago, but today, even if the CIO likes you, it doesn't necessarily mean you get the mandate, right? It has to right. go through many hoops, you know, investment committee, boards and all that. But it is the working level that you really need to kind of also build a good relationship with because they are the ones that will be writing all these recommendation papers to the investment committee. They would be the ones that would be drafting up your investment management agreement. So I think in the early stages, and I have to admit, you know, quite raw at that time, I did not see that part of it. So when we got our first mandate, then I felt it took such a long time for us to get funded because we just did not anticipate that so many back end stuff. We had no idea who the operations guy was who was setting up our trustee account and custodian accounts, the legal guy. And that took a long, long time. And also, I think that is uh, sometimes it's also a feeling of belonging, I guess, within the firm. You know, everyone wants that sort of airtime with you and not just them and the bosses and yourself. Um, so that was a good learning. You know, so after we won that first mandate, we changed tax and really started doing it in a much more systematic fashion. So we had built the relationship with the upper layer very good. We will only go and see those people for certain kind of things. But when it's kind of like introducing a mandate, we would actually test it with a different group of people. Um, yeah. Clever. So, yeah, because uh, my, my thinking on that was that if every time you ran to the CIO and he doesn't like the idea, you have no recourse anymore. If you tested yeah. it with a working level and they kind of liked it and they can convince internally to their bosses, you still have some way to go, right? Mm. You know, so you can build that interest upwards rather than hitting the ceiling immediately. Oh, uh, yes. That, that was also a learning that, you know, sometimes it's not always good to just go straight to the number one. You know, it's good to go to the number four first mm. and then slowly build your way up. Yeah. So interesting. 
Yeah. That's so interesting, uh, Jaleel, because I remember when, you know, a, couple, a few years ago when we, we caught up for coffee, um, one of our many coffees actually at TWG or Sandwich, or I can't remember where, but I remember your insights about Malaysia and how to like approach it were so interesting. And I was thinking that, look, I've got lots of clients that are trying to get raise money in Southeast Asia. Like they call in, they're like, oh, look, we're looking to set up in, in, in Singapore and we want to go out and raise money in Malaysia. And I was just thinking that they need to listen to you, right? Because there's an approach, right? Apparently, there's, uh, the way you were speaking to me, it was like, you can't, even if you've got the best performance in the world and you turn up in Malaysia, and you do the, do it the wrong way, there is no way you're gonna make money, right? It's, it was words to those effect, and it was like, if you don't have a, such a great fund, but you do things the right way, um, and I remember you cited some examples at that, that time. R would you mind sharing with the viewers that train of thought? That was really interesting. So I think uh, the key is trying to understand who are the large clients here. I categorize Malaysia and even Singapore, Indonesia in probably three buckets, right? You've got the large clients, the EPFs, the sovereign wealth funds, the pension funds in, in the first category. These are clients that would give you 100, 200 million per pop kind of mandate. Then you've got the second tier. They are probably insurance firms. They can give you maybe that 50, 70 million kind of mandates. And then you've got the third one, which is probably like statutory boards and smaller ticket size as well, maybe 20, 30 million. But the approach in each of this is very different because the sophistication level goes a lot lower as you go down that route because people in the third tier, the statutory boards, are probably just grasping the idea of outsourcing money and they probably wouldn't go anything beyond their, their domestic currency. So it'd be a very localized mandate. And I think a lot of the discussions there would center around why on earth should they pay an outsider 50, 60 basis points to manage money when, you know, I could be doing it myself or I could be giving it to somebody else cheaper. So it is a right. very price point kind of discussion early on mm -hmm. with that category of people. And then with the second tier, the insurance firms, it's mainly product. I think sophistication level is quite advanced because they're regulated, but it's having the right product. But it's also not a very sticky clientele because they tend to switch quite often. The stickiest would probably be the first category. But the first category is where I think a lot of people looking at Malaysia from outside make a big mistake and say, well, we've got a lot of money and, you know, if I can have 1% of that, it would be great. But there are obligations for these clients to keep a certain amount of their assets invested in Malaysia, which means that what they can outsource overseas is not the entire AUM but still a very, very sizable amount, right? You know, 30% of 1 trillion ringgit fund, it's still a, it's <laughs> a 100 billion US dollars that can be farmed out. But there, I think what they're looking for is that what are we getting out of outsourcing this money? It is not just performance, but I think they're looking at knowledge transfer because they're saying that, okay, I'm going to pay you 50, 60 basis points. Fine, I give you an investment hurdle of 8%, which you have achieved. But at which point do we say, hey, we've been paying you guys for 10 years. Can my guys do it themselves now, right? So they then mm. over the years started adopting an approach that they said that we will outsource, but at some point we will insource it back again. Oh. We'll insource it back again as we build our own internal knowledge. So that in the minds of the fund managers, they need to make sure that they know that, okay, I have this mandate for the next five or seven years if I do well, but I need to think about what's the next mandate that I can do, right? I've mm. done plain vanilla equities. I've done fixed income. Maybe the next one is multi-asset. Maybe the next one is something real estate or, or private equity or something like that. So it's about constantly like moving up the curve. And I think one of the big mistakes has been that, and even sharing from experience is that we may have pushed too much of that same product in various iterations, right? Or oh, okay, have an ASEAN equity or Asia equity, China equity. But at some point, there's a lot of massive duplicates, uh, duplication mm -hmm. amongst all those mandates. And then someone else comes in and says, let me offer you something in Sukuk or credit. Mm -hmm. And then they can raise more money because the allocation there was never untapped, right? right. So that is where I think the big differentiation. The other one is performance, right? From experience as well, I think we have won mandates, not because we were the first 
number one or number two top performing fund. But because we were the most consistent from a client servicing perspective, client servicing mm. can mean various things. It can mean that the relationship manager is someone who has built a very good relationship with the client. And then your operational client service is very, very up to date. Like if they want reports to be turned around T plus three at the end of the month, it gets turned around very quickly. You know, it's just like a machine. I always told my client relationship team is that uh, I think the barometer of success is that they call you for anything that they want to know. It may not necessarily be related to their particular mandate, right? You know, we could be managing a Asia PAC mandate, but they, I want them to call you asking for what are our thoughts on US? What are our thoughts? So once we have mm -hmm. developed that sort of relationship, they're comfortable to talk to us mm -hmm. about anything and ask about anything, knowing that we may not have the answer, but we can find the answer for them. For me, that's a good benchmark that I think we have done well from that client relationship thing. Yeah. And that involves working with a lot of the operational guys, uh, working level guys. In fact, as part of the process that I'm very particular about that I told the team is that we must know the entire chain. Like if today we pitch, is there going to be a second round, third round, fourth round? How does the elimination process work? When does it go to investment committee? Mm. Who presents at investment committee? You know, I've even asked some clients at that, what is it that you want from us that would that would make us stand out at the investment committee. Right. That's a good question. What information do you need that we can articulate our story better? So over the years, I think I've realized to keep things simple, less jargon, and over the years, just focus mainly on the softer part of things. Performance, performance is measurable. It's there. You can't explain it in any different, in any other way. It is what it is. But I think what differentiation you bring, you know, I can put the clients as an intern on my desk for two months so that they can understand how we operate. I can give them access to some of the client seminars that we do. I can take them for company visits. And these are experiences that they won't get in their own firm, but mm. they can get it with us. And so if they signed up with us, they're not only getting a decent performance, but they're getting access to all these other things as well. What's really interesting here, what you've just shared, is that in order to be successful in Malaysia, knowledge transfer is important to them. You've also talked about that if you don't have the best performance, it's still okay because if you can just try to get them into the right process, give them you know, a, a really systematic way of them knowing that that knowledge transfer will take place and that you're going to take them out. Like It's so clever, right? Just take the client for a company visit. Like, that's amazing. Like, you know, just put an intern in there to show them that, you, you know, you know, you've got another source in there to understand what the client really wants. A lot of firms probably don't do this, right, Jalil? What do you think? A lot of firms, what's, what's the normal approach? People go in there and they're like, you know, I want the money and they skip all of this. Yeah, so I think this is where I think the big dilemma happens about the world of compliance, right? Mm. You know, in the early days, we took on interns from the client side quite easily. But over the years, as compliance became a lot more complex, you know, people say, oh, should we be taking on other people? Should we be sitting on the desk? But my argument was, yes, we can. It's just that, you know, we just limit access to what database that they can access, right? But I think the whole idea of bringing someone in, a client, I can have the best pitch deck, go in front of a client and wow them with my investment process. But taking one of them for a one hour meeting and them sitting in and listening to the questions that we ask is far more powerful, right? It's far more powerful because they would go back and then tell all their colleagues about it, tell their bosses about it. That's the biggest validation I can get. Uh, I, I continued doing that. I was a big proponent of it. I always offered that, whether it was seminars or not. But also, I think you need to understand level of sophistication, right? You know, with Singapore clients, they're not really quite a keen to sit on the desk. Their level of sophistication is quite high. But they were very keen to participate in things like investment seminars. Sometimes we will have a two, three day investment seminar in New York or London, and we will roll out a lot of good speakers, not necessarily just investment people, but politicians, you know, to understand geopolitical risk, for example. And those would be events that they would be very, very keen because they know that, look, they can get access to the finance fund managers and trading platforms and all that. 
but it's getting access to these people and these sort of IPs and insights that they were very keen on. It was really about trying to put them in buckets and trying to see, okay, this would trigger them and, and make them happy. But these clients may not be ready for that. They just want some basic understanding about how you know we operate our system. I've even, in fact, offered one of the IT guys to sit with our IT guys because they were quite fascinated wow. <laughs> with some of the operational stuff that we did. So, so you know, it may not necessarily just be an investment guy sitting with the fund manager. It can be one of your traders sitting with your traders trying to understand how the trading system works, mm. right? You know, yeah. Mm. So I've essentially said, tell us exactly what you need, what your gaps are, and we'll help. Yeah. If there was a, let's say, a single country focus fund, right? Kind of mediocre performance go but you know historically done pretty well looking to go into to malaysia to raise money let's say they followed this advice how far do you think it would take them do you think that they would have a chance well if single country it'll depend on what kind of country right if it's a small country if someone is raising an indonesian country fund in malaysia may not go very far because i think level of sophistication in gale has also increased you know there are a lot of local funds who manage those sort of single country funds and they do it quite well but if it's say for example a greater china fund Okay. You know, and that's done decently well trying to raise money here. I think they'll do quite well simply because I think there is still an IP attached to mm. having boots on the ground in countries like China. Mm. Whereas I think Malaysia from KL, I think as a fund management hub, they've done pretty okay managing ASEAN pretty successfully mm. from KL. So the whole, is there a value add for someone, say from Manila, to kind of pitch into KL for Philippine equity fund? Probably not, you know. And also, I think, you know, in terms of the interest base would be a bit more smaller. But you're talking about countries like China, right? You know, mm -hmm. that is a great value add to say, oh, this they have a 10-man team in China. They speak Mandarin. They know the stocks. They know the... Mm. They know what the government is thinking. Um, it, it would do quite well. But again, raising money from a retail perspective is very different as well. It's very different because a lot of the retail money raising is done by uh, agents and banks. So it is like a machine that gets mobilized. I was just going to ask you about this retail thing because we, we haven't touched on it yet. And um, that's really interesting. Could, you, could we double click a bit on that? Versus like, you know, like the, the retail versus the institutional market. How is that different for these funds? It's different because I think that in, in retail, you don't go on talking about your investment philosophy. You don't talk about really your team. You don't talk about your risk management. Although my personal view is that people should be asking those questions, but you don't because retail is a lot more like a FMCG of finance, right? It's very fast. You know, you, mm. you, you team up with the banks who act as distributors and then they will have a huge marketing campaign. It's like a well-oiled machine and bam, they will launch the event, you know, then the fund manager will come in, present the fund. And a lot of the questions, I can assure you, 90% would center around performance and future performance. Hmm. Whether these are retail clients in Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, anywhere else, same questions all the time, right? <laughs> uh, same questions all the time. But, you know, hardly ever do I ever get a question in a retail pitch about how do you incentivize your fund managers? What if the person leaves? What's your philosophy? What are things that you would and would not do in this fund? These are questions that the INSTI clients always ask. Which is why I said that in INSTI, you can be the number three performing fund and still win the fund because you have figured out all the other things like, you know, the risk right. aspect, the team, the succession plan. What if things go wrong? We've got a plan B, plan C, you know, every, we have a backup. Our system is good. Uh, you know, our mm. reporting is good. But whereas for retail, it doesn't really matter, right? You oh, know, okay. it's, it, it's somebody putting in... 1,000 ringgit. When I say it doesn't matter, the buck, the onus on that is on the banks uh, mm. to kind of do that duty on you. Whereas the aim is just to sell the fund, you know, yeah. and raise AUM quickly. And then whereas I think with the in-store clients, it's a lot more slow burn. It's a lot of relationship building for the first two, three years. I always say with, with in-store clients, it's probably trying to get your foot in the door for the first two years. 
Mm. Jalil, what would you say then, um, if you could summarize the secret sauce that you've used, right? The, the recipe, the ingredients. Let's talk about Malaysia because Malaysia is very close to your heart, right? What would you say? Would you say like, okay, if you've got great knowledge, if, you're, if you've got an idea about how you're going to transfer that knowledge back to the client, you're going to have a way to kind of engage their teams to, that, to make them understand the investment philosophy better and so on by taking them on company visits. Is there anything else like, or would you say that that's pretty much the secret sauce? So I would break it down into various phases, right? The first phase is know exactly what clientele you're approaching because you just cannot go gangbusters and just just say, I want, I want to have 50 clients. You can have 50 clients, but in what category, right? So be very, very focused. Am I going to hit the institutional market or am I going to do, be doing the intermediaries or am I going to be doing the retail? Be very clear on that first. And then once you're clear on that is to then have a good idea on organizational structure and the people, not just senior management, but the entire chain of people. Understand that process very well. And that process may not be the same for all the institutional clients, right? And then within the firm, there can be much more influential individuals who are larger than life who could have a big swaying power in certain decisions, right? right? So they need to be managed differently as well. And then the third is keep presentation deck simple. Keep presentation deck simple. I've always been quite keen to look at presentation decks of competitors if I can get my hands on it. And I absolutely <laughs> love looking at it. You know, some of them do a really good job breaking down a very, very complex product to something that is simple. I saw a competitor's pitch deck of a factor investing fund, but they use an anatomy of a human body <laughs> and, and, and explained it in that way, right? You know, about the proteins, nutrients and all that and why you need all this in the right oh. uh, amount for you to have, you know, so-called the right body. Uh, and they yeah. explained factor investing in that way. It was a very easy way to understand even from somebody who was not very good in finance but you know that is i think where perhaps sales need to kind of push it a bit and kind of think of much more clever ways to get that idea across because it may not necessarily be you know, i mean the standard pitch deck of saying i have 50 funds is on my top 10 in me top 10 makes up 40 percent you know it, it, it's it's a bit dull because especially when you're pitching a fund where there are a lot of competitors, how do you stand out there? Right. Um, mm. So I think those would be the three things. Know your client. Second, work the relationship across the board. Third would be make the pitch deck simpler. And then maybe the fourth one is treat them like a partner rather than a client. Right. You know, mm. um, because I think fund managers today, if you look at it, even, even today, the last two, three years, fund managers have evolved, right? They've got robo-advisory arms. They've got wealth management advisory arms and everything. So there's a lot of IP access that they can give the clients. That will be very, very useful uh, mm. for them. Uh, an example is that a particular fund manager could be a large shareholder of an insurance company. You know, and, and your institutional client is also also owns an insurance company, right? Um, so I always try to research and find out where the commonalities lie. And then, you know, in conversation, I say, oh, you know what? You, you guys own two insurance companies. We own 10 insurance companies. You know, would you like to have a chat with our insurance guy to kind of understand what we think about the insurance market and everything? So it's trying to just sit down, have a think, where are the commonalities and where I can link people up, right? Yeah. So, uh, Jaleel, look, that's, that's a great recipe. I'm sure if you follow those four pieces of advice that you've just given, like let's just say any fund out there could probably do that and raise money in any market, right? I mean, it's, they're very useful, but particularly for Malaysia. You use that, you raised billions and billions of dollars. Great, love it. What about the times, could you talk about a time where you followed that and didn't get the results or perhaps you weren't following that and then didn't get the results and how you, you know, some of those war stories perhaps, you know, that'd be really interesting for people to listen and, and, and understand. I think um, 
you know, some of the failures are looking back, it's probably not understanding some cultural nuances as well, right? Uh, in some countries, it is super important to have a local person fronting it. Right. What do you mean by that? Like, so like you, you could have to hire somebody on the ground? Correct. Correct. You have, right. you have to hire a local on the ground. And it may not be the most technical person. It does not matter. But in some cultures, I think there is a lot more air of comfort and familiarity with a local. Uh, and then even when you're doing meetings, you need to kind of go with the local. Whereas in some countries, it's okay. In fact, in some countries, it's a bonus if a foreigner comes in. Uh, <laughs> because they feel that, you know, oh, wow, someone is coming in all the way to see me. So yeah. I think there is a need to kind of understand that. I think in countries that we have pitched but not made far is is always trying to kind of find that that middle ground, that bridge that we've not done very well. And I think in some countries as well, when I look at failures, is that we probably under or overestimated sophistication levels. We mm. went in there and then said, okay, well, they're the central bank. I'm sure they understand. So we go <laughs> in and present and then we don't hear from them right? It's just yeah. because the thing was too complex. If I took Malaysia, for example, I think one thing I look back and probably felt that we may or should have done better was probably come up with more variants of Sharia products. Oh, okay. There was a great demand for it. But I think at that point, as the industry was in its infancy, there was a bit of a reluctance across the industry as a whole to kind of spend time trying to find a Sharia version of a private credit fund, for example. Now, I'm out in the industry now, but I, I always tell friends that if you can have a Sharia version of a private credit fund, you will raise billions right now in Malaysia. So much money looking for Sharia <laughs> stuff, Sharia private equity or Sharia real estate. From a, a product perspective, may be challenging, not impossible, but you will raise a lot of money. Because first, once you do it, you won't have competition with a lot of other fund managers. So you can go in there and perhaps walk into probably three or four of the largest clients here in Malaysia or Indonesia even. So I think that the product sophistication was something perhaps that I felt maybe we could have done better and had a, you know, nice monopoly. But, you know, there was maybe an element of trying to stick to what we know and try to sell that. Yeah, so I think that would be, for me, looking back, that was perhaps one thing that we maybe underestimated, mm -hmm. you know, like whenever they say Shari, we're like thinking, oh, is it because you want it or is it because, you know, yeah, you, yeah. you think it's a nice to have or it's a must have. But over the years, it was pretty clear that it was a must have, you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, by which time I felt that it could have been used to kind of structure something and do a lot of the hard work. And uh, I guess the other learning was also that in some countries, it is very also important to maybe have a local partner. In a place like Indonesia, having a local minority partner was very crucial. They were minority. They didn't play a very big role, but people had a sort of comfort knowing that the firm had a minority local shareholder, that their interests were taken care of. Uh, it, it's, it's something super small that you wouldn't think about from a business perspective. You would think like, okay, what, what does a 10, 20% minority shareholder bring? It brings comfort to a lot of people. All right. You mm. know, so in our presentation decks, we always say, hey, look, you know, we've got these guys as minority shareholders. They're very crucial in terms of relationship building, but we bring in all the other expertise. You know, it's a great marriage and everything. Compared to saying, I'm 100% foreign owned, I'm here, you yeah. know, and it does sometimes throw people off. Like, you know, what do you know about the country? What do you know mm -hmm. about us? All right? Yeah. So, you know, I think looking back, those were very valuable lessons that we cannot just have a chocker block approach to ownership in markets, you know, and just try to push the same product. And I sometimes it is, it is worth going out and spending time creating a new product for a market because that market is big enough and you could potentially raise a few billion dollars. So it's, it's worth the time. If you, if you, do you remember once, um, it was a few years ago, and you told me that if you approach a client in Malaysia and you go directly to the CEO or the CIO, that might not be the best thing to do, but you've got to build it from the ground up 
which is something you've already alluded to. But for example, in other in other markets, like what was it, Indonesia or Thailand, I can't remember. And you said it was kind of the opposite, right? Um, I just want to double click on that kind of nuance, right? Like why does that, ha- why is it like that, right? I mean, is it a cultural thing or is it more, yeah. I think it's a, it, it is it is a cultural thing, right? Uh, you know, I think it depends on what you are discussing. My view on that is been that if if you have a meeting with the C level, the CIO or CEO, it's to really kind of be more courtesy call, put a face to the name, introduce the firm, and not do the hard selling, right? You know, just kind of mm-hmm. say, hey, what mandate are you looking at, and everything, and then try to follow that up with the working level. Because I think being seen to be hard selling and kind of putting pressure from the top may upset a lot of the working level people who say this is completely not in line with what we're doing and we're being kind of forced this down our throat, right? This is in Malaysia, right? You talk about Malaysia. So. Yeah, it is in, in Malaysia, yeah. But I think in certain countries where it's a bit perhaps less developed, maybe having that conversation with the CEO is quite important to say, I think this product is good for you where I think the level of sophistication is a bit more lower and they lean on you for that advice on how the asset allocation should be. That's where you come in and say, I think you should be doing it this way, right? Mm. But I can then talk to your working level team, put me in touch with them and I will walk them through, right? So it's a a different, but if you're sophisticated, kind of sophisticated, you know, I mean, I, I have a, I have a unique experience of having been an asset manager for many years doing fundraising and managing money and then being an asset owner, being a CEO of a, a PNB where fund managers came and pitched to me. So I went to the other side. So I was them uh, for a good 15, <laughs> 16 years. Right. Yeah. Uh, but, but I, I, I didn't like it. People coming and pitching and telling me my asset allocation should be so and so I felt that okay, we know what we're doing from an asset allocation, um, yeah. you know, and, and there was a reluctance for me to push that idea down because I just said it's not going to work and I don't like the way it's been approached, right? So it's just trying to understand, right? You know, it's like you, you going to a GIC and telling them, you know what, your asset allocation is completely out of whack, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> They'll be like, what are you talking about? Yeah, it's that's not going to really work, right? But I think if you're going to them and saying, you know, this is something interesting we're working on, you know, Mm. would you like to have more chat on it and everything? Uh, It's a different conversation, right? Mm. But whereas I think in places like, you know, when Indonesia was still coming out and trying to create more new products, Philippines, Thailand, I think they did appreciate the fact that we gave some thought about what were the gaps in their own products. But you also have to approach it subtly and say like, you know, um, you know, I think these are the gaps based on what you said. And I think we found something that may be good, mm. you know, run it through. If the guy is convinced, then ask him to put us in touch with the working level. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's cool. And the, the other thing I wanted to double click on is the point you made about Sharia funds, right? Yeah. And I guess in general, just making sure that your fund or whatever you're trying to sell is actually what the client actually wants, right? In certain markets. Yeah. Um, so like... In your experience, I mean, did you guys set up the the Suku? I mean, did you set up those uh, Islamic finance funds and did you get any resistance or was it kind of like, no, this is exactly what we want to do? You know, what was the rationale there? So when when we, uh, when I set up the Islamic arm in Malaysia, I think it was not very difficult to convince the bosses because the Malaysian government was giving out a lot of money, seed funding. So right. when, when we did the mat, it was quite obvious that, you know, if we got the license, we would have two, three hundred million US AUM from the start. So at least that there was a sort of confidence that there was some business that was that will already be in from day one. Right. So that gave us the confidence to set it up. I think that the challenge came after that about, all right, how do we latch on this and launch more newer funds? Because as simplistic as it is, it was a deviation from what we did. An Asia PAC equity fund may have 40 stocks. An Asia PAC Sharia fund may have 22 stocks. It will take out the banks. It will take out the insurers. It will take out a lot of other companies that traditionally pay high dividends that are also big index players in the market. Mm. So the performance will go completely out of whack compared to the yeah. conventional side. Were we willing to do that? 
were we willing to have a variation of that? So that was always going to be the key blocks. But did the clients look at it that way? No, the clients looked at it and said, look, we are happy to have lower returns in an Asia-packed fund if it's Sharia. Wow. Yeah, so, and, and they, they were happy because they said, look, a lot of my people, a lot of my clients are okay taking 6% returns compared to 9% in a conventional because they feel that, you know, it's more important to do it from Sharia perspective. So I think that that is where I think there needs to be an, an understanding that, you know, it's not always about performance for some of these people. It's about, you know, having that uh, comfort that what they're investing in is, is faith related, right? Mm. Yeah. I think, you know, it's not very different from ESG funds, right? You know, I yeah. think, you know, if you look at ESG funds, you do eliminate quite, a, depending on how you define ESG, you do eliminate a large number of holdings. Mm. But I think people who go into that are looking at it from an impact perspective. Yeah. Rather than rather than to outperform the market like like a hedge fund, right? You know they're not they're not looking at it from that perspective. Correct. They're looking from an impact. So I think when when you, when we look back, uh, perhaps maybe Sharia should have been marketed a bit more differently. I felt. And what can I ask you why? Why is it that I think it's a no brainer? I mean, there's like two billion uh, Muslims in the world. I mean, it's it's one of those things that you know should be done. Uh, more aggressively, I think. Why is it that it just hasn't, you know, fund managers don't look at it in that way? Like it's like you've just given an example, like you just set up a private credit fund, you're going to raise billions. You know, you are a prime example of somebody that did it. And the clients like say, hey, we don't even want 9%, we want 6%. Like, I mean, that's got to be dream for fund managers, right? Like, so why is it do you think this is not happening so I think it's branding, right? When, when you say Sharia funds, it's like faith-based, right? You know, so a lot of things start, you know, uh, coming into your head about, you know, the kind of investments that you make, this and that and everything. So I, I, I always say it's more of a branding thing about how it's branded, you know, compared to things like, uh, like, an, like an ESG, right? That's branded in a completely different way because of impact, this, that, and everything. One of the big criticisms about Sharia fund back then was the definition of what is Sharia compliant, what is not, because the right. definition differs country to country, right? Malaysia could take a much more liberal stance on it compared to certain parts of the Middle East. I said, well, it's not different, any different from ESG, right? You know, you, you have Norwegian exactly. clients, Scandinavian clients taking a very structured strict approach to certain things um, and then you can have other clients who are just starting out and just doing something more basic so you know there's no right or wrong and somehow this industry you know we like to put people in boxes uh, you know whether <laughs> you know all ESG should be like this all Sharia should be like that but you know it, it's it's different right people's definition is different uh, so I think we're seeing that now in, in products, you know, a lot of firms have started going and saying, we want to not have products that are available over the shelf, but we want to do customized products, you know, uh, it's okay for us to have 10 different variants of a global equity fund that suits, um, suits whoever, right, mm. you know, yeah, so I think, um, I think the industry needs to evolve from a very chocker block kind of product approach to a more customized fund approach, right? And I think the marketing and, and the way it's presented should be, should, should change, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, yeah, it's just something that I've always wondered um, because ESG has completely branded completely differently, right? Yes. Absolutely. I mean, it's cool, right? It, it, look, it makes it look like, oh, wow. And it's investor driven as well, right? Yeah. Whereas I think, even though Sharia funds could be investor driven, but yeah, what, what you're saying does make sense. Um, I want to go a little bit more into your personal um, attributes, actually, Jalil. Uh, if you remember, I did ask you once this question. I don't know if you remember, but I was like, what was it that, you know, that you that got you to where you are? And I remember you gave me a very humble answer and, and, and everything. But there was one thing you also mentioned, which was that you regularly journal. Right. And um, so you've been doing that for like since the age of what? So I've been doing journaling for 25 years. Uh, you know, my, wow. my, my, my dad wrote a diary, you 
know, which yeah. I thought was quite cool, you know. And uh, then I started journaling. And then about maybe about four years ago, uh, my wife said I should get it digitalized and help me get it digitalized. So now it's properly archived by dates, by topics, by by whatever. Could make a book out of it. <laughs> so I have everything in there from my old company visit notes right up to my observations of whom I've met, my meetings with various individuals over the years, my thoughts. And when I left PNB and I had about um, eight, nine months break in between my current job, uh, I did a lot of reflective writing about, you know, regrets, successes, the highs, the lows. So when you ask me those questions right now, I'm a- able to kind of reflect on it quite quickly because I've I've done a lot of uh, reflection. <laughs> I was going to say, not many people would be able to break it down so easily, right? So um, I write that and I, I try to make sure that, you know, I learn from it. Um, so when I left BNB, I kind of knew exactly it, my next role. What is it I mm. wanted to achieve? What mm. were the skill gaps that I wanted to address in my next job? One thing I was very sure about was that I had always been in very structured environments, uh, you know, in a regulated Mm. entity, you know, working in fund management and as an asset owner. But I wanted to put myself in a much more entrepreneurial setting as well. Mm. You know, because I think when you put yourself in an unfamiliar situation, it forces yourself to be adaptable. You know, when you're in a very structured environment and you're surrounded by almost similar kind of individuals, you do take that definition of success probably a bit too literally, you know, and say, oh, I'm successful. But, you know, you've always been surrounded in the same industry, same kind of people, same kind of thought process or, or knowledge and everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so th- that's, that's uh, you know, I, I've journaled and that I found that very, uh, very, very useful. I also, when I journal daily, I kind of talk about what my observation was of that particular individual you know, from characteristics and everything. So so if I meet somebody and I met somebody about two weeks ago and I reminded him that I last met him 17 years ago at what event? And he said, what did you think of me at that event? And I told him exactly what I thought about him, right? Because I, I had it written down. Wow. Found him a bit shifty and everything. But, you know, that was probably... <laughs> I like to see my notes, what you've written about me as well. <laughs> Chelsea supporter, you know. But I mean, I mean, it's really interesting. I mean, so, okay, so you did it because your dad did it. And you did it because it helped you probably structure your thoughts going into new meetings. And then it became kind of a permanent thing, which you've been doing for, what was it, 25 years, you said? Um, it's amazing. Like, So what, what other things do you do that, that kind of, that you think could have or could attribute to your success? Um, I enjoy meeting people. So the importance of networking is something I've always, always treasured. I turned 40 in July this year. So I tell friends that I'm reaching a stage of my life where my classmates are becoming a bit more useful uh, <laughs> or, <laughs> uh, uh, are, holding, are holding much more senior jobs either in government or, or whatever, politics or, uh, or not. Uh, but it's important to keep that relationship going, right? You know, mm. you don't want it to be a transactional relationship. So, which is why the journaling also helps me to kind of break it down into putting people in kind of categories, right? These are people that I think are important from a corporate perspective. But, you know, over time, some of them become friends. A lot of them mm. do become friends. And it's important to keep that relationship going. You don't want to be one of those that remain silent for five years and then, suddenly the guy becomes CEO of a pension fund and then you say, hey, remember me, you know? Yeah. But it's nice when you have kept in touch with people. So what I do tell my PAs is that I give a list of people that I want to meet every three months, every six months or once a year. Uh, and they will they will follow up and, and, and make sure that appointment is scheduled. I know about these people quite well. So I know where they're comfortable going out, where they, what they like to eat, what they like to do, and everything. I'll find out. I I, I know wife's names, children's names, what they do. Wow. Uh, yeah, and that's why the writing does help, right? Because I, I, I jot it down so I can always reflect back. So I try, uh, I do a lot of that, right? You know, my, my, my wife is always giving me uh, crap for it, saying I'm, I'm out having <laughs> dinner every day. But I say it, it, it's, very, it's, it's very important, right? You never know when you need to reach out in, into your mobile phone 
and send this WhatsApp message, right? And things get done. Uh, it may be something super simple, but you know, I, I, I'm always a big believer in that. I enjoy it. It's not for everybody. Mm. I don't think going out, entertaining people and keeping that network is something that everyone can do. I enjoy it. So that's why it's it probably helped, right? It's a combination of a lot of things. Huh? So I would mm. say, I think uh, journaling has kept a uh, data very up to date. It has kept me, it has allowed me to do things on a personal level rather than transactional, uh, keeping that relationship going through networking. The other thing is, uh, people don't like saying this, but it's luck, right? You know? <laughs> It is luck, right place, right time, you know. Uh, you know, I was very fortunate. I joined Aberdeen at a time when Aberdeen were very small. Hmm. I, I don't think I would get into Aberdeen today, to be honest, right? You know, it's the competition. It's just so uh, so tough, you know, the kind of people that come through. Uh, you know, we were a very relaxed firm at that at that time. But we, we had great, great bunch of individuals. And I also had great bosses who were happy to take a leap of faith on a 26 year old <laughs> yeah say look just just don't screw it up right you know other than that you know let's learn from our mistakes importantly they were okay if we did mistakes right and yeah i i, just, I always say that it was it was you know luck right you know then things happened you know i yeah. i left my first firm Aberdeen. uh i didn't want to leave but i felt that i was only doing equities uh, and I wanted to learn about fixed income, private equity, real estate, everything. So this opportunity at Invesco allowed me to do what I did, but across different asset classes. So I learned a lot about factor investing, multi-asset wow. and everything. And then I was quite settled in Singapore. And then this opportunity came to go back to Malaysia. And at that point, I had reached that stage, maybe because I, I had uh, peaked early in my career, I wanted to give back. I wanted to have impact. I wanted to, you know, I, 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 I was one of those, right? You know, yeah, yeah. and this job was very, very impactful. I signed on for three years. Unfortunately, um, I left after 10 months when the Malaysian administration changed and I disagreed with the direction of the fund. But it's okay. It was a fantastic experience. I said I would never change it, right? Yeah. Yeah, you, you've learned a lot and you've achieved a lot more. Right. I haven't met that many people that became CEO at the age of 30 right, or 26. Right. And then, you know, some of the stuff that you've spoken about today is just truly remarkable. Um, really interesting. I mean, it, uh, you know, I wish these things existed right back when we were young. Right. Like, you know, like when you're breaking in. So like if you were to give some advice to fund uh, fundraisers right now that are hitting the pavements, going out right now, um, trying to make trying to make money, right? For that and, and what would what would you say to them? Like, I mean, what are the th key things to keep out keep a keep a good um, handle on um, that could help them? What would you say? I think fundraising is rewarding, but requires a lot of grit and disappointment first. The true answer is grit, right? Because you know, you're just banging on the same door and nobody opens the door. But then you've done enough of legwork and then the door opens and slowly you make your way in. Relationship is very important. Uh, never underestimate the fact that clients in the same countries talk to each other. So how yeah. you behave with one, uh, they talk to the other. So if you're selling A to this client and B to the other client, trust me, they will find out. They will know. Okay. They will know. They would know uh, because everyone looks towards everybody. Industry is small, especially in countries like, uh, you know, Malaysia, Indonesia. We all know each other, right? And it's very easy to check on things. Even even I've left the industry now, and I still have clients asking me about this particular fund manager. Say, oh, you know, this guy's emailed us. What do you think about this guy? Do you know the CIO? Do you know this portfolio manager? Um, so you know. Uh, that importance of relationship, right? That that goes mm. there. That's to build that trust. So I think my advice would be that it's going to be a long, hard road. So you are going to get roadblocks and that doesn't mean it's a failure. Keep on going. Secondly, importance of, of building genuine, genuine relationships. Unfortunately, I think some elements of the industry has become very transactional. You know, it's just like, okay, you're not going to give money. Okay, I'm going to move on, going to move on, going to move on. But those who have built that, very nice relationships have actually gone quite far. I would say then the third part is knowledge, right? Be aware of what your competition is doing, right? 
be be absolutely aware how are they marketing who is marketing uh, you know what are they doing differently and you can find all this out by speaking to clients especially working level they'll tell you you know i i always spend time with them and ask them well, who else has been pitching they say, oh this company that company no, I say, oh, how are they different? They say, oh, you know, we actually like the way they present this. We actually like this product because it's so unique. We like this fact that they have this automated system. So that makes you think, right? You know, when you go back for your distribution kind of meetings, like, you know, guys, you know, this is what our competition is doing, right? So yeah. that you're not trapped in this single mindset, this funnel mindset that, you know, you're, you're all great and everything because the, pro the innovation happens so quick. Uh, it can happen from a product perspective, technology or anything like that. So know your competition very well. Yeah. Great, great. Look, we're, we're sort of, time is catching us. So we're going to have to sort of um, move on to the, the, last, the last couple of questions that I wanted to get in, if we can. Um, you, you've become an angel investor now. Like, how's that been? And, um, you know, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I've been, I've been investing in several companies, uh, minority for for maybe the last two years. Uh, I think one thing about not being in a regulated environment is now I'm a bit more freer to kind of trade the market and do yeah. my own investments. Um, so yeah, I've invested in uh, the food business. I've invested in some tech business and everything. Um, I think for me, it's it's just it was just a natural evolution because I spent my entire life analyzing companies, mm -hmm. trying to ask manages the right questions, this, that, and everything. Um, so it's now me doing it on a personal level. But I think after investing, I think I do enjoy the mentoring aspect, especially with some of the technology companies where the founders are young and they're looking for, I guess, guidance. They're looking for network and everything. And that's where I come in. I'm pretty clear. I'm, I'm not a tech person. I'm not going to tell you how to run the company. Uh, yeah. But you know, I, I can give that sort of guidance into like, you know, this is what your competition is doing. Perhaps you should be looking at this. What is it help that you need with? Who are the companies you want to put in touch with? And, and, I've, and I've done that. So I think having been in corporate as well for the last one year or so has given me a good understanding of the true challenges of operations. Uh, you know, as a fund manager, you sat on the other side and you start saying, oh, you should be doing this, 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 this. <laughs> but, now, but now sitting here, you know, there's a lot of nuances and, and moving parts that sometimes you feel that, you know, you need to kind of juggle it in, in the most pragmatic way. Uh, so it's given me a, a massive, massive experience, right? You know, everything from... Uh, running everything from a uh, gaming, hospitality, retail, food, car business, football clubs, and everything. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. Talking of football, last question: Are Liverpool going to win the league? Absolutely, yeah. you know, hundred percent. Uh. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, we're you know we we have a game in hand. We'll be six points behind. We play City. We'll beat City, and then City will drop points, and then we'll we'll win the <laughs> league by one point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you had a bit of a moral dilemma, was it, a week ago? Because you've invested into Cardiff City, haven't you? And at the same time, you're a you're a Liverpool fan. So how did that feel? <laughs> Absolutely. You know. So uh, you know, I'm chairman of a, um, a Cardiff City football club and also KV Kotrick in Belgium and uh, FK Sarajevo in Bosnia. So I chaired three football clubs and I never thought in my wildest dream uh, that Liverpool would get drawn with Cardiff. So it was one of those first time in, in over 33 years of supporting Liverpool that I I kind of didn't know how to react, right? You know, the head said, the head said Cardiff, the heart said Liverpool. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was a stretch for Cardiff to win against Liverpool. But uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I hope that never happens again, that draw. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. well, let's hope Mo Salah stays as well. He's a, he's a great guy, even though I'm not a Liverpool fan. But um, look, it's been an absolute pleasure, uh, Jaleel, having you on the show. It's been so informative. Um, I love sitting with you. And I think I could probably sit here for another hour quite easily with the kind of questions and the kind of in-depth insights you're able to give. It's so interesting. And I'm sure the listeners, they'll be delighted with, with all this free information that you've just given them, right? And um, also some fund managers out there that are looking to break into the Malaysia market, they're going to find this information very valuable. Would you be okay if people wanted to reach out to you over LinkedIn, following yeah, sure. the SME? You're okay to sort of, yeah. you know, talk to people um, and provide feedback or... Yeah, I'm, I'm, 
I'm I'm always happy to give any any sort of guidance. I'm always happy to meet new people. I'm always happy to share experience. Uh, I'm yeah. quite active on on social media, on LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, do people do get in touch? And I don't I don't mind. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, well, look on on that note. Thank you very much, Jalil, and uh, look forward to seeing you in your next in Singapore, which I hope will be soon. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yes. So thank you very much, Jalil, and any of our listeners, if you're a fund manager looking to expand and raise capital in Southeast Asia, if you need any introductions or know how you want to speak to people like Jalil, feel free to contact us on our information, um, as you'll see below. Um, we'll be glad to help you wherever we can. Till next time, thank you very much.